We just finished the journey through Genesis. Now we're going to look at the expedition through Exodus. And just keep going through the books of the Bible over and over again. We already finished Genesis through Revelation once. Now we're just starting back all over. And the more you do it, the more you learn. You're never the same person as you were the first time you went through. You need to be growing more and more each year, every time you go through the Bible, verse by verse, or book by book, or chapter by chapter. Usually, I do verse by verse, but now we're going to do book by book. Again, go through it again this way. And this helps keep our mind fresh on the entire thing, because you know when you just do a topic or verse by verse, you get kind of bogged down in one spot, and you can forget stuff that happened throughout the rest of the Bible. I'm all the time studying a certain part of the Bible, and then I won't go back to that for a long time except in my reading, and I'll forget all about everything that I learned. This way, you can keep your mind fresh on the entire Bible, or at least more fresh on it than you would if you just only do topics or verse by verse, because you're going through the whole thing at a consistent rate. But this is the expedition through Exodus, and Exodus means to exit or a way out. And that's because in this book, God is going to get the children of Israel out of Egypt. And it's also called the Book of Redemption, or the second book of Moses. You see, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the five books of Moses, they're all written by Moses, and this is the second one. So the author, obviously, Moses. And it's got 40 chapters, 1,213 verses, and around 32,692 words. And in this book, Christ is pictured as our Passover, as it calls him in 1 Corinthians 5, 7. And as you're going to see in Exodus chapter 12, you're going to see the Passover for the first time. Now for our three applications. Historically... What you have in the book of Exodus is the trials and bondage of Israel as God forms them into a nation. And the redemption of Israel through the Passover lamb shows their new life outside of bondage. Now devotionally for us, the devotional application is the Passover lamb pictures our redemption through Jesus Christ, our Passover lamb. And the tabernacle is a picture of our body. You're going to see about the tabernacle. Both the physical tabernacle back then and a tabernacle which is our body today, both are dwelling places for God's Spirit. Now, the doctrinal application Moses and Aaron are going to picture the two witnesses of the tribulation, which will be Moses and Elijah. Pharaoh is going to be a picture of the Antichrist who's going to show up in the tribulation. And, for example, the plagues that happen in Exodus, picture the plagues that are going to happen in the tribulation. Now, in Exodus, you got three major divisions. The first one is chapter 1 through chapter 12, verse 36, and that's Israel and Egypt. The second one is chapter 12, verse 37 to chapter 18, verse 37, and that's Israel in the wilderness. Then chapter 19, verse 1, through chapter 40, verse 38, is Israel at Mount Sinai. Now a bigger breakdown. In chapters 1 through 3, Israel pictures lost people under the bondage of Egypt and afflicted by Pharaoh. Now Egypt will picture the world. Pharaoh's going to picture the devil. So Israel pictures... Lost people today under the bondage of the world and sin and afflicted by the devil. They're in Egypt. They're being uh, tormented with hard bondage under Pharaoh and under these wicked men. Just like today, uh, lost people are, whether they know it or not, are being tormented by sin, continuing in this lost world afflicted by the devil. Then in chapters 4 through 6, Moses 
is going to be raised up, a deliverer. Really, chapters 3 through 6, Moses raised up, is going to be raised up a deliverer for Israel. And he pictures the Lord Jesus Christ. Chapters 7 through 11, you're going to see Pharaoh, a type of the devil, is the adversary. And he does everything he can to keep Israel in Egypt. Just like the devil does everything, everything he can to keep you his child. Chapter 12, you're going to have the Passover. Salvation through the blood of the Lamb. Picturing the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. So you have them, you have lost, uh, Israel pictures lost people under the bondage of sin in the world and the devil. You got Moses, a deliverer, picturing the Lord Jesus Christ. You got Pharaoh, the devil, Picturing the devil who's trying to keep you in, under the bondage of the world. But then you've got the Passover lamb. Pictures the blood. It pictures those lost people getting saved. So then in chapter 13, you've got sanctification. He, he, the Lord tells Moses to sanctify them. And see, when you get saved, you get sanctified. You're set apart. Then chapter 14, you got the Red Sea Crossing, which pictures baptism. In 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 2, the Red Sea Crossing is actually called a baptism. And what did you do after you got saved? You got baptized. Not to get saved, not to stay saved, but it's one of the things you do after you get saved. Then chapter 15, you got the Song of Moses. And you know what? After you get saved, you get a new song in your heart. Just like they got a new song. After they did the Passover, they got a new song in their heart. Chapter 16, you got manna from heaven. Picture in the word of God. Chapter 17. Chapter 17, you got the fight with Amalek. And this story pictures war through prayer. It's about your prayer life. Chapter 18, you got Jethro's bad advice. Chapter 19 through 24, you got the law, God's standards of holiness. In chapters 25 through 27, you're going to see it start talking about the tabernacle. 28 through 31, you're going to see it talking about the priesthood. Chapters 32 through 40 is about working with the saints and their sins. So there was a quick little breakdown, and now let's look at each chapter. So in chapter 1, you're going to have the names of Israel that came into Egypt, and you're going to see how Pharaoh is intimidated by Israel. And Exodus 1.1 starts with the word now. Leviticus starts with and, and Numbers starts with and, showing you that these books are a continuation of each other. They go together and can be read as one long book. In Exodus 1.6 it says, And Joseph died and all his brethren and all that generation. So Joseph, that last main character we talked about in the book of Genesis, has died. Joseph and all that generation of Israel died off. And now a new king came up in place of the Pharaoh that was a good guy that had favored Joseph. And it says in verse 8, And thou rose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. Since Joseph is a type of Jesus Christ, this picture is Israel being under a king who doesn't know the Lord. And it can picture sinners being in bondage to the world under the God of this world who doesn't care anything about the Savior. And notice Pharaoh is very intimidated by Israel. In Exodus 1, 9, it says, And he said unto his people, Behold, the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. So Pharaoh fears man, and he doesn't fear God, which makes sense because he doesn't know God. He believes Israel will join up with their enemies and wipe them out. And it says in verse 10, Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply. And it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us 
and so get them up out of the land. So he's worried that they're getting too many. He thinks they're they're growing too much and they're going to join up with the enemies of Pharaoh and gang up on them. And see, with man, numbers matter. Pharaoh's worried about there being too many of them. With God, numbers don't matter. You see, in Joshua 23.10, it says, One man of you shall chase a thousand. For the Lord your God, he it is that fighteth for you, as he hath promised you. You see, with the Lord, numbers don't matter, because you got the Lord. When all you got is man, and you're just a man, numbers do matter. But notice the problem that it is wicked men who want to kill babies. You see that in this chapter, just like in America today. In Exodus 1, 16 through 17, you're going to see Pharaoh's wicked plan. And he said, when you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then you shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men children alive. So his plan is to kill all the male children that are born. He thinks, you know, Israel's getting too many, growing too much. So he wants to kill all the male children and keep the female children. And in Acts 5.29, it says this great verse, and it goes along with what the midwives did at the command of Pharaoh. It says in Exodus 5.29, Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. You see, the midwives feared God, and they didn't do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men children alive. You see, sometimes rebellion becomes godly. It's better to do right and get in trouble for it than to do wrong and get in trouble with God. You see, Pharaoh can't get the midwives to kill the children. So he charges all the people to kill every son. It says in Exodus one twenty two, And Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born ye shall cast into the river, and every daughter ye shall save alive. How can Pharaoh do something like this? It's because he doesn't know the Lord. So he's doing what's right in his own eyes. He has no conscience about treating people wrong because only he only has to answer to himself since he doesn't know the Lord. And the more wicked you live, the easier it will be to do more wicked things. The harder your heart will become. And men do crazy things when they get afraid. And what have we seen in this chapter? He is afraid. Now look at chapter 2. In chapter 2, you've got the birth of Moses and Moses killing the Egyptian. So Moses is hid in an ark of bulrushes by the river's brink, and his mother wanted to make sure that Pharaoh's henchmen aren't going to come kill him. Because, you know, he's a male child, a male baby that's born, and Pharaoh's commanded everybody to kill all the male children that's born. But something amazing happens. Pharaoh's daughter ends up finding Moses. And Moses' sister's there. And she suggests that she get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for Pharaoh's daughter. And of course, she's going to go get Moses' mother. All without Pharaoh and his daughter knowing that it's his mother. And Moses' mother then gets paid wages just to nurse her own child. And Moses grows up, ends up killing an Egyptian and hiding him in the sand because he was messing with one of uh, his Hebrew brethren. And Pharaoh finds out about it and wants to slay Moses. So once again, Moses has a hit out, hit out on him from Pharaoh. And Moses gets to dwell in the land of Midian and finds a Gentile bride there named Zipporah. And Moses is a great picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Moses takes a Gentile bride. This picture is the Lord Jesus, who also takes a Gentile bride, which is us. 
And the Lord hears the groaning of Israel in Egypt. The children of Israel are down there crying to God because they're, they're having to serve with rigor and hard bondage. The Lord hears the groaning of Israel. And his heart is turned towards Israel. So what, what's he going to do? He's going to raise up Moses, the deliverer. In chapter 3, he starts talking to Moses. So in chapter 3, you have Moses in the burning bush. It says in Exodus 3, 1, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. So notice that Moses is a worker. He's responsible. He kept the flock. And right here, he is a shepherd over sheep. But soon he's going to be a shepherd over people. And you can already learn a characteristic of Moses to take with you. And that is, be responsible. Most people today can't be left in charge of anything, let alone living people or animals. They won't even run a drive through And Moses is on the backside of the desert. And you might be on the backside of the desert right now in your life. And God's dealing with you about using you. And Moses isn't some, you know, some big great person. He's a sinner, just like me and you. You're going to see he's got problems. He's got fears. And has all kinds of stuff going on. And it says in Exodus 3, 2, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. So the angel of the Lord is the Lord himself. And he's appearing to Moses in this bush. It's a, it's a pre-appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's fitting that he appears in a flame of fire. You know why? Well, Hebrews twelve twenty nine says, For our God is a consuming fire. Deuteronomy 4.24 says, For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. Deuteronomy 9.3 says, Understand therefore this day that the Lord thy God is he which goeth over before thee as a consuming fire. He shall destroy them. Revelation 19.12, His eyes were as a flame of fire. When he comes back at the second coming, it's going to be in flaming fire. So it's fitting he comes in fire in a bush. But the bush is burning, and yet it's not consumed. And it says in verse 3, And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said unto God, Who am I? that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt. Moses has the right attitude. He says, who am I that I should do this? You know, saying, how could somebody like me do such a thing as this? But he's got something wrong at the same time. It's not going to be him. So there is no need to say, who am I? Because Moses is going to have the I am. Don't worry about who am I. If you've got the I am, because he's going to take care of it. He's going to do the job. He just needs you to do it through you. you got to be willing to let him. In Exodus 3.14, and God said to Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. So you want to know, who am I, Moses? Well, you're the one sent by the I am. And in Exodus 3.20, it says, And I will stretch out my hand, the Lord says this, and smite Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in the midst thereof. And after that, he, Pharaoh, will let you go. So God wants Moses to go to Pharaoh about letting the children of Israel go so they can go and worship him. Now chapter 4, the Lord gives Moses the sign gifts. You see, Israel has to have signs. You see, today, me and you, we walk by faith, not by sight. But Israel walks by sight. And in 1 Corinthians 1.22, it says, For the Jews require a sign. And the things Moses do will resemble the signs of an apostle that you see in the book of Acts. And it talks about this in 2 Corinthians 12.12. 12. 
Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. You see, the Jews require a sign. They need to see something. And in Exodus 4, 1 through 4, it says, And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me. So that's what this is about. Moses is afraid that Israel's not going to believe him. So the Lord's going to give him some signs so that they will believe him. He says, They will not believe me nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. And the Lord said unto him, What is that in thine hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, Cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. And the Lord said unto Moses, Put forth thine hand and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. So Moses just took up a serpent. He's the first snake handler in the Bible. And in Mark 16, 17 through 18, it says, And these signs, this is a big chapter for signs, Exodus 4 and Mark 16. It says, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. So notice that in Mark 16. One of the signs of an apostle is being able to take up a serpent and get bit by it, possibly, and it not even hurt you. Kind of like Paul in Acts 28. In Acts 28, 3 through 6, Paul is bit by, by a venomous snake, and it doesn't hurt him. You know why? Because he has the signs of an apostle. So there's no need to be afraid of a serpent when the one who made the serpent told you to pick it up. Now... I would not advise you to go pick up a serpent. You don't have the sign gifts. But this is where those crazy people get the idea for snake handling today. They say, well, Moses did it. Paul did it. The disciples could do it. But they have no idea what they're doing or talking about. We don't operate by signs today, but by faith. And I just seen a clip the other day of one of these uh, snake handler guys up in the mountains of Kentucky or somewhere, West Virginia. And he he had that snake on his on his back, and it bit him, and he's just he's bleeding everywhere from his neck, and um, he's starting to look visibly dizzy and sick pretty quickly. His wife's watching, his parent, his children are watching as the men start taking him out of the church, and he looks like he's I don't know if he made it or not. That's stupid. You don't have the signs of an apostle. You shouldn't be out there picking up snakes. You're not Moses. You don't have the sign gifts. You're not the apostle Paul. You don't have the signs of an apostle. The signs are about Israel and convincing unbelieving Jews that you're the real deal. And it says in Exodus 4, 5, you see this? You know, why am I giving you these signs, Moses? that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob hath appeared unto thee. So what's the point of signs? It is so that they, the Jews specifically, will believe Moses has been sent by who he claims to be sent by. It's for the Jews in the Gospels and in the book of Acts to believe that the apostles are truly from God. And that's the reason for the signs in the book of Acts. And in, you see it in the Gospels in Mark 16, 20. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. See, the signs are about confirming the word. It's not about making you look spiritual. It's not about proving that you're saved. They don't prove you're saved. It's about the apostles needing proof for the Jews that they really are who they say they are and that they really are from God. And now the next sign in Exodus chapter 4, 6 through 7. And the Lord said furthermore unto him, Put now thine hand into thy bosom. And he put his hand in his bosom. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. And he said, Put thine hand into thy bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again and plucked it out of his bosom. And behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. So this is like the healing gift the apostles had. Not like the TV evangelist crook has. He does not have it. You see, in Mark 16, 18, they could, it says, They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall rec recover. Moses was the first snake handler, 
And he's also the first faith healer. You know, they got the healing lines where these phonies will have you get in a line and if you got something wrong with you and they supposedly heal you. Now, maybe the devil does. The Lord allows the devil to heal some people every now and then. But for the most part, these people are phonies and they're out for your money. And in Exodus 4, 8 through 9, it says, And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first son, that they will believe the voice of the latter son. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe also these two sons, neither hearken unto thy voice, and thou shalt take of the water of the river, and pour it on upon the dry land. And the water which thou takest of the river shall become blood upon the dry land. See, wine in the Bible is a picture of blood. Turning the water to blood pictures Jesus Christ turning the water to wine. And with all this backing up Moses, all these signs that the Lord's promising him, he's still afraid. You see, Moses is just like me and you. In Exodus 14 and 11, it says, And Moses said unto the Lord, O oh my Lord, I'm not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant. But I am slow of speech, and of a slow tongue. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth, or who maketh the dumb, or deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? You see, the Lord made your mouth just as he made everyone else's mouth. And he says, Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. And he said, O oh my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. So Moses is trying to back out, and the Lord gets angry and tells him that his brother Aaron can be the spokesman for him, and that he can tell Aaron what to say. In Exodus 4, 30 and 31, And Aaron spake all the words which the Lord had spoken unto Moses, and did the signs in the sight of the people. And the people believed, and when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel, and that he had looked upon their affliction, then they bowed their heads and worshipped. So, Aaron is going to help Mo help Moses. He's going to be the spokesman. But you're going to see that Moses is going to be the one that ends up doing all the talking. Moses will finally get confidence in the Lord that he needs. But Moses does all the... Moses and Aaron meet up first, and Moses shows him what the Lord just showed him with the rod. And Aaron's going to do the same thing in the sight of the people, and the people believe. You know why? Because the Jews require a sign. They respond to signs. Now, chapter 5. In chapter 5, Pharaoh won't let Israel go, and Moses is discouraged. So Moses and Aaron go to Pharaoh and let him know the Lord wants him to let Israel go, and he basically acts like they're a joke. Exodus 5, 2, And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord. Neither will I let Israel go. And this is the attitude of the average person you talk to every day. They don't know the Lord. They don't obey his voice. And they say, why should I obey the words of God? In Exodus 5, 3, and they said, the God of the Hebrews hath met with us. Let us go. We pray thee three days journey into the desert and sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. You see, Moses left out the part about how God said that Pharaoh's firstborn would be killed if he didn't let the people go. You see, never trim your message. Notice, they say, notice what nothing they say will convince Pharaoh. He believes the children of Israel just don't have enough work to do. He thinks they need work added so that they won't even have enough time to think about such things as going to worship God in the wilderness. He thinks that's crazy. He thinks it's a waste of time. He said, ye are idle. Ye are idle. Therefore you say, let us go and do sacrifice to the Lord. Go therefore now and work, for there shall no straw be given you, yet shall you deliver the tale of bricks. So he tells them you're just idle. And he lays more work on them. You see, the devil would love to keep you so busy that you don't have any time for God. You see, the workplace will keep you busy, so busy that you don't have any time to do anything for God. So you have to cheat the system, you see. You see, I study while I'm working. I listen to preaching while I'm working. I read the Bible on break and witness at work. You see, it's not just a Sunday morning thing. It's an everyday thing. You, I, we do it every day. You got to read the Bible every day. You got to pray every day. You got to listen to preaching every day, if you can. 
You need to if you can. I mean, obviously, not everybody has that luxury. But multitasking is key if you can do it. Exodus 5, 22. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Lord, wherefore hast thou so evil and treated this people? Why is it that thou hast sent me? Don't expect things to go your way right away. You see, God's not in a rush. But just believe 